I thought we should start with something quite different for an image. So we've got our Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles, these action figures from the 1980s. Um, we're not going to talk exactly about these because the Ninja Turtles, here is Leonardo. We're going to start with Leonardo. Here's Michelangelo, we'll do him next. Here's Raphael, then he'll come. And then where there should be Titian, instead we have Donatello from the 15th century rather than the 16th. Uh, Hannah Gadsby and one of her, I hope you know her um, comic, um, comedy hour performances. She had one in which she mentioned the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. And she said, ah, Donatello doesn't belong there. It should be Titian. But teenage boys couldn't handle a word that begins with T-I-T. -T. So that's her explanation why it's not there. The, the fellows who came up with them said, it just seemed like the quirky, appropriate name for these odd <clears throat> action creatures. And they are most definitely most famous. i uh, give you their dates. Now you know that this particular series will go for seven weeks rather than six. It's, okay, four artists, seven weeks. Well, I want, I'm, we're certainly not going to see everything these four artists did. But I did want to show also uh, some not such irreverent, more contemporary responses to these artists who have always in the West been dominant figures ever since their lifetimes. Um, and if you talk about Renaissance art to people who are not particularly interested in art, these are more likely the names that come to mind. Now, um, the slightly more familiar, we'll know to call them high Renaissance. The high is simply um, a term of approbation is to say, oh, these men are the best. Uh, <clears throat> and it is true that they introduced changes into the art of the 15th century, which had already been reviving classical antiquity and showed a renewed interest in representing the real world and an interest in um, exploration and uh, kind of a verism that was not typical in, in any medieval art. <clears throat> but as I say, even their, their colleagues and people afterwards saw that they made such very significant contributions as well as being towering figures in themselves that then this, the art of their time is called the high Renaissance. And actually the high Renaissance doesn't last all that long because it presents an art that suggests a perfectible world, a robust uh, existence um, of beauty and certainty and uh, human triumph and Circumstances in Italy and the rest of Europe simply didn't bear that out. So even by the end of the 16th century, there was something quite different came in. So it's a sort of like a brief high point. <clears throat> and from his lifetime on, Leonardo was considered to be the sort of the initiator of something new. So I'm going to actually go very slowly, sort of ambling uh, with him in the beginning because uh, I want to set up what was and then how he changes what goes on. Um, there's no way we can cover the whole range of what he does, no matter what. But let me give you a little more here, just introduction. So, what, this is a reminder, we always think of just Italian art. Well, these are all people who spoke Italian, but they, uh, are, Italy was a patchwork of 
uh, here you have the area around Florence, which is a republic, but then there's a duchy. This is a kind of a free site here, the papal orients here. And these areas were often, if not in competition, would, they would be in actual warfare with one another. We have artists who worked in several of the areas though. So here's Florence, the hub. Here's Vinci, it's only about 16 miles from Florence, <clears throat> which is where Leonardo comes from. And then Caprese, Michelangelo, that's this is about 50 miles away. That's Michelangelo's hometown. Then Urbino is where Raphael comes from. And it's true that Titian is the physically and um, visually the outlier of them all because he works uh, from Venice, which had a, a different kind of culture, which was a little more oriented toward the East and the Byzantine world. Um, and he was born up here, sort of just below the Dolomites up here in Pieve de Cadore. So, and Leonardo works in Florence, in Milan, in Venice, the Papal States, and then ends his life in France. Here's Vinci. I thought we should all travel a little. I needed to travel, so I brought in the pictures of their hometowns. The little town of Vinci, where his father, who was a notary for the government in Florence, a notary was a very respectable position. You had to be fairly well born to, to have it, um, where you were in charge of all documents and the, sort of the administration of the area. Um, that's where Leonardo's father very briefly uh, was sent to work. And while he was there, he had an, I don't, know, I don't even know if he had an affair, but anyway, he made a local peasant girl pregnant with Leonardo. His father would never, despite Leonardo's surpassing fame, so that by the end of the life, he's essentially invited to be a guest of the King Francis I of France, um, Leonardo's father would never um, recognize him. So he was, a, it was always an illegitimate child, which was a very sore thing with him. And this is where Michelangelo was born. He was raised by a wet nurse who was uh, in a little town that was given over to um, working the stone. And he said that he, he breathed in or he took in the love of, of sculpture with, with his, essentially his mother's milk. <clears throat> Urbino, Raphael's hometown. His father was an artist, so he's, He's one who came from a, a tradition. And then Pieve Cadore with the mountains in the background. Leonardo, all you need to do if you want some, as if you needed any, any evidence for how extraordinarily popular Leonardo is, go over to our library and look in the children's books. And in the children's books, there must be 20, maybe even more than that, with Leonardo in the title. Um, there, there are no libraries that don't have works by Leonardo because publishers know that this is something you can make money on. Everybody knows, everybody loves Leonardo. You can do anything if you have Leonardo's name on it. Um, Leonardo was, too many things to enumerate, but trained as a painter. Uh, and I'm going to spend some time with his training as a painter. A painter uh, working in a workshop where the teacher was also a sculptor. So he learned about sculpture. So painter, sculptor, 
He never actually built a building, but he was an advisor on the construction of some buildings, um, providing and then also just tossing off ideas for buildings, um, knowledgeable about the one high Renaissance and, and a good friend of the one high Renaissance architect named Bermonte. Um, so painting, sculptor, architect, musician. Um, then we get into the world of, that comes out in his drawings. He was of all things insatiably curious about the world, trusting the authority of his eyes over anything learned in a book or anything taught by the Pope. Um, so he's considered a botanist, an anatomist. He was gonna do comparative anatomy, not just human anatomy. He did about 30, he estimated about 30 dissections in his life. Um, uh, he was a hydraulic engineer. He invented weapons of war. He um, was a map maker. We know he was, we know about his interest in flight. Well, then he actually made um, a name for himself or um, gained fame for himself in his lifetime in an evanescent kind of art that we don't have anymore. He was marvelous at creating um, great festivities. I was thinking of the Met Gala the other day like this, like uh, people with costumes and then uh, marvelous sets and fantastic things like a, a mechanical lion that took a couple steps and then you tapped it and it opened up and flowers spilled out of it or um, a rotating sphere that opened up and there were people in that or um, just, just elaborate spectacles and pageants, uh, which were of course resounding to the glory of whoever the patron was who had him do those. So he did, um, spectacles, pageants, other kinds of ephemeral work as well. He always had some pupils. This is a drawing of him by a young nobleman who later on in his life became one of his most devoted pupils, a man named Francesco Melzi, who um, collected the output of Leonardo that most occupied him actually for about half his creative career. And that was drawing, drawing for notebooks. He was essentially trying to conquer all of human knowledge and he was going to present it in a series of books. Well, it turned out that he wrote haphazardly and a lot of you know he wrote from right to left because he was left-handed. But um, he jotted notes on everything and he, when he even traveled, he had thousands of pieces of paper with him and Melcy was going to put them together. Only one of these treatises ever saw the light of day as a treatise, and that's a book that Leonardo wrote called On Painting. Um, but they're just vast numbers of drawings. And this drawing, which is by Michelangelo, most people say is a portrait of Michelangelo, but there's actually no, nothing to verify that. It could be just his concept of a sage old man because he was interested in, in every physical type, all ages, all types. And it is known that he was exceptionally beautiful. Uh, he cut a fine figure wherever he was. He had long, light colored hair, wavy down below his shoulders, and he wore the most expensive clothing, the finest velvets and reds and salmons. And uh, he had a coterie of young assistants who would also be very beautiful young men, um, several of them who stayed with him all his life long. And one he was just totally besotted with, he was a little crook, but didn't, that didn't bother Leonardo at all. So he was a handsome man and he truly was a wise man. And to the extent this looks like a wise man, maybe this is a portrait. But we're gonna start with the beginning of his career. 
Uh, this he actually signed uh, in 1473. So he's a young man, uh, just coming out of his teens, a drawing of the Arno Valley, and they, they can even identify what this castle is here. This is an area that, as a child, Leonardo loved to tramp over and study everything from rock formations to the smallest pebble, from a leaf on a plant to the whole structure of the plant. Uh, he just had this omnivorous interest in the natural world. And um, according to current knowledge, this is probably one of the first images, at least that survives, um, by anyone that shows simply the landscape. Well, you can see there's human habitation here, but, but it's, there's no figure. This is not for a background for a figural scene, that he's looking at nature itself, the world itself as uh, worthy of interest. And you can see, this is before he's had much art training at all, that he's just um, a, a gifted draftsman. There's a wonderful new biography that I will soon return to the public library here about him. And he said the one thing that Leonardo got from his father that really mattered was as a notary, the notary had lots of paper. So Leonardo always had paper available to sketch things, write them down. But when he was around 14, 15, uh, <clears throat> he, his father and the family agreed that he could do what he wanted to do, uh, which was to um, go to, to study to be an artist. He, his career, had he been legitimate, probably would have been pre-chosen for him that he in turn would have been a notary. He would have had a, a, a solid, substantial, prestigious um, life path. But since he couldn't have that, he didn't get the education a notary would. So for example, he didn't know Latin until he was about 40 when he set out for himself to learn it. And he didn't learn advanced math until he set out on his own or he met mathematicians or he gathered treatises on math that he was able to study that. So he had just basic reading, writing and elementary arithmetic. Before he went to the workshop of and then he went to this workshop as a uh, Florentine, very um, established, significant artist, a man named Andrea Verrocchio. That's V-E-R-R-O-C-C-H-I-O. Uh, and Verrocchio, as I mentioned already, was a painter, and there are a number of significant Florentine painters who worked in his workshops. It was definitely the place to be, but of his own production, he set up primarily as a sculptor. And Verrocchio did this statue of David, which people tend to say, you can say it, there's no way to prove it, um, that this is, um, that, that the young Leonardo served as his model for that. But among the things Verrocchio did uh, was to carve figures for, this is that grain exchange in Florence, where in the first half of the 15th century, the most significant Florentine sculptors like Ghiberti and Donatello were um, given uh, commissions to do saints in these niches. And Verrocchio was asked to do, uh, actually replace something that wasn't very good, and he was to do Thomas, who tests Jesus aside to see if Jesus has risen from the dead. Is he? Is the so-called doubting Thomas. He said, well, I won't believe that he's there unless I can touch him. And these were hollow cast bronzes. This was a, a, a terrific technical feat to do this without very much patching. It's a, a lot of controlling the flow and creating the molds and... Um, you think in, uh, at this time, they didn't have to have the modern scientific controls or what were the alloys that were going into the bronze, nor the temperature for keeping the material. So 
it's uh, far more skilled and more prestigious than just painting. Or he did this uh, broker did this uh, clay terracotta bust of Giuliani um, de Medici uh, here as a young guy, probably just about when he was about to turn 21. Um, and Verrocchio's great uh, patron was the Medici family. So indirectly, Leonardo has a good connection there. Now, this is not Verrocchio, but I couldn't find anything available as an image from Verrocchio's time. This is from about a century later and it's actually in Northern Europe to give you an idea of what it would be like to work in, in, in a workshop if you were a pupil. The, in, in exchange for the instruction, of course, you had to earn your keep. And in this, you see the way it's done. There are over here um, artists who are grinding pigments. And then here's the master artist at work. Here's someone learning to copy, probably copying this bust here. Here's a, must be someone like a journeyman, almost ready to, to graduate and have his own career, taking a portrait of a woman who of course would have to have a chaperone there watching her. But it's not the grinding pigments or copying from sculpture that I brought this in for especially, but for what's up here. An artist or here. Since there was not any mechanical means of reproduction and there was no sense that there was something wrong with getting a copy. Uh, if an artist did something that was highly prized, um, the pupils would often make copies of it. And that was handled by the original work having some drawings made probably to full scale or sometimes bit by bit. And those drawings could be kept and then they could be copied and they would be copied by, by what's called pouncing that all around say it would be like the contours of the source. There would be little holes punched and then it would be pushed up against the candle and then you'd put um, charcoal. So you'd get those little dots. So you could immediately transfer the design and then the apprentices could actually carry out the work. Now this is also a, a later work. And this is another way they would learn. Say, apart from the actual works, uh, a master artist might make drawings and then the pupils would learn, okay, this is the way you do a hand. This is the kind of articulation you give. This is a graceful pose. This is how you turn the finger here. And they would learn to copy this. So they're not necessarily having someone pose there with a hand like that. They could learn from the drawing rather than from real life. That's not Leonardo's way. This drawing, is known it comes from Verrocchio's workshop. And it's a pretty astonishing drawing because this looks like it's well on the way to being a finished work of art because it's not just an outline where you could pounce it and you, you could copy the details, but it fills them with a great deal of shadow and, and great complexity. So it's, it's almost like a fully worked thing just ready to have perhaps some tempera color put over it. But that drawing, just to give you an example, here's some works by Verrocchio. A Madonna and Child, it's a marble panel of a kind that a private patron might ask Verrocchio to provide uh, for family devotions to have a work like this. And her face is quite similar, the facial type as in that drawing, or you could also use it for paintings. And this is also by Verrocchio. And this is a typical mid 15th century Florentine 
styled work of art. I'm going to show you some by Botticelli as well, who's also worked a little while in Verrocchio's workshop, but was more exactly uh, Leonardo's uh, contemporary. But in Florentine art, what was prized most of all was drawing. These are drawings filled in with color, lovely color, but it's drawing that they valued most of all. And they picked that up partly from um, so much relying on drawing ancient sculpture as a way of, of learning rather than from a live model, you copied an ancient sculpture and you copy by drawing it. So drawing just had this primacy for them. Now, this is more of a Rocchio, but this is also Leonardo. Uh, evidently, there's been work done recently, you know, as they're doing more technical studies on paintings, where there's been some discovery about the way pupils were used that were not understood before, that um, as pupils moved along, so they developed a degree of proficiency, they wouldn't be asked, say, to, oh, with your red, come in and paint all the red parts in here. Or you've got the blue, you come in and do the blue. This is the master who's provided the design. No, there would be little segments of the painting that would be given to different pupils to carry out. And there's the preeminent drawing and vivid color here, except for this little hound down here and possibly this fish. This is a, uh, an altar piece that shows, it's a, a not particularly common subject of a, an angel with a young lad named Tobias who's caught a fish and gutted the fish. And then angel has a, the fish guts in here and they're going to go back and um, be applied to Tobias's father's eyes, Tobit, and um, cleanse them of blindness. So it's a sort of a arcane subject, but Archangel, this, uh, uh, Archangel Raphael was very popular in Florence. So we're gonna look at this. See the paint's very thin here. It gets, gets thinner over time. But there, there's that drawn outline then filled in with color. And you tell me where there's any outline in this lovely little pooch. They're curving fine, small strokes of color, and then they bend off into nothing. This is look, going to look not so different from it toward the end of Leonardo's life, his drawings uh, he did of, uh, of water. But this kind of, it's just painted and in a completely different way. Look, look at all this, not painted. It's not a shift of color. He leaves it out. And the form is made out of shadow. So even as a pupil, Leonardo is working differently from everybody else. And this most definitely involves uh, Leonardo's participation in a work by Verrocchio. There's here too some discussion about just precisely which pieces are by Leonardo. It's the baptism of Jesus by John, John the Baptist. And, the dove of the Holy Spirit comes down here and it's witnessed by two angels. Of course, it takes place in water, just barely covers their feet here. And then there's a watery, rocky landscape. Any of you have had art history of this period? Probably any of you looking at this for a few minutes, you're gonna know, what's, oh, well, I, yeah, I can see the part that's Leonardo, this. 
and quite possibly this, which looks very different from the landscape over here. Someone has tried to claim also the body of, of Jesus. <laughs> With Leonardo's work, there is so much not known. The dates of works, to what extent he did some of these. Uh, it's another part of his being very elusive, but here. Oh, yeah, I see the dog's hair. But there is something so profoundly different here. In this angel, uh, you could well imagine that this is one of the younger lads in the workshop who's been asked to pose, because that's one thing also that the um, young members of the inner workshop would do, they'd often be called in to serve as a handy models for, for an artist if he, he wanted to see a pose. And he looks like, uh, this looks actually like very much could be true to life. You have this youngster who's been told to look up and look reverential. And so here's a kid posing, trying to look reverential. Um, and then here. He is looking referential. Leonardo talked about wanting to show the physical and emotional motion in figures. So you, you sense the, the ardent uh, attention here. This is not as if it were someone posed, nor would you find any person who looks exactly like this. This is an idealized rather than a realistically versioned figure. And how very few marks of any outline, possibly right here, but not around the nose, not around the eyes. These carefully done separate strands, not here. All right, so that's one thing. Interest in light. Oh, that always is so much of. Leonardo's interest. Look at the, you know that these are not transparent, but they're translucent. There is that blue, but you see the reflected light. There's more light on this than on this, a little bit less, a little here. This is in shadow, it doesn't get it. This bit of braid, oh, this is in shadow, no sun there. and the angle of the head. This is, um, it, it's a tilted head and it's slightly turned. And then the eyes turn up. So the head's tilting back and then the eyes turn up. So there are different parts of the body moving on different axes. And this is a key picked up. Um, and spreads like wildfire in high Renaissance art. If you want to make a figure look truly alive, you don't do it by taking a life model and imitating him, drawing him and putting him in. You make these subtle adjustments. You make him turn on his axis. You make parts of his body move against other parts of the body. So although when you look at it, you don't say, oh, I see he's doing that. There is that sense of just like a, a core vitality and a capacity for motion that, that we, we pick up on. And then this is another way probably he did as a, um, he was still a student, uh, an Annunciation. So this is the mid 1470s. And here you can see that he didn't get to start as a student as early as most of the artists because he didn't really learn perspective right off. There are some infelicities here. This little stand for the Virgin has the Bible open here as the angel comes to announce that she's to bear the Christ child. Do you see that? We know that in perspective, lines that are perpendicular to us, parallel to each other, if you look at them going off into the distance, they ought to converge at a single point. Well, these two do. 
but it's not at the same point where the lines on the building do or on this parapet do. Whereas there's only one of us and it should, so everything should converge at a point that's at our viewpoint. He hasn't learned perspective. He's gonna to have to learn that on his own. And there's something else strange. This may be not quite so strange. Her right arm is awfully long, but there's a suggestion that you were not meant to see this from straight on. It's, um, he's very interested often in a sort of like um, adolescent figures where it's their male or female natures are not fully defined um, yet. So there's a it's kind of an ambiguity. But you see, he has studied hands there. And this is a Botticelli. This is actually in the map. And um, an artist who's taught one point perspective. Oh, the Florentines were mad for it. They, they, this application of science um, in the study of the recession of space, blending the fine arts and, and science in that way. So this would work out. You could take the coffers on the ceiling. You can take the wall along here. And again, of course, it's, it's just this alternate and very linear form. Here's a little more evidence that he's learning. Another challenge for a painter, other than how you uh, persuasively suggest deep space on a flat surface is to suggest persuasively solid forms hidden under cloth. Um, and he, I don't do too well here. So you'd say that this is a thigh and this is a thigh, but they certainly don't come together here. And this is the toe of her shoe. She don't see the shape of the shoe. Here's his drawing for that sleeve of the angel. And his very careful drawing that he then uses for her skirt. Now this is um, possibly the first work that he did independently, not, not in Verrocchio's workshop. The dating of these things, the identification of them is, is in many of Leonardo's works, uh, provides many, many people a, a career because they're unknown. Their, their works are known by title and then their paintings, they say, well, is this what that one is that's mentioned in the documents? Is this by Leonardo? Is this by somebody else? Is this by one of Leonardo's pupils? All told, there are only about 16 paintings um, securely identified as being by him. This is called the Benoit Madonna, B-E-N-O-I-S, and it's in the Hermitage. And um, it wasn't in, well, almost, I think in the 19th century, that that was accepted as being by Leonardo. Uh, his originality shows in another way. The theme, I'll come back to this in just a minute, very standard, Again, for families, they would have, it's, it's a Madonna and, and child image. And the little child here is, has a plant and it plant is in the shape of a cross. So that's the sort of the, the symbolic meaning as if the youngster who still, look how ham-fisted he is. I mean, he really can't even control it quite as, but he's so interested in it, bringing it up to himself at face um, that that's the, Christian symbol in there. So what's new here? Well, first of all, it is that this is a real child and a real young girl for Mary, rather than the standard uh, forms that uh, another way that he's giving a kind of a, a sense of reality. And 
the Christchurch was awfully chubby, but that was the standard for, for infant boys. Infant girls, it doesn't matter, but little boys are supposed to be really bulked up. And then the other thing is that it's swallowed by shadow. Well, that will be a hallmark of his work. See, this theme of the Christ child with a flower, oh, so common. This is um, Gentile di Fabriano from, hmm, well, it was even old fashioned in this day, about half a century before. But you see, there wasn't a, there wasn't a need to make it look real because it, what it carries is a symbolic message. And you contemplate the message and you think about Mary as the queen of heaven. And a painting like this or most paintings into Leonardo's own day would be evaluated, would be prized by the cost of the materials. That's what determined the worth of a work of art. And this is lapis lazuli and this gold. This is an extremely expensive painting, which does honor to the Virgin and the Christ child. It does honor to the patrons who paid for it. This is reframing it entirely. Although there's not much light, just this one window. You see how he, again, is working with. Now I'm gonna assume a fair number of you saw this just pre-pandemic when it was in the map to celebrate the 500th anniversary of Leonardo's death. This, which uh, is in the collection of the Vatican, was lent to the map. And it's um, an unfinished painting for the Saint, Saint Jerome. where we can see that no one knows why it wasn't finished, but we can see how Leonardo works. I'll give you what this story is because the power of his imagination comes better than two. Um, so St. Jerome, one of their early, well, he's one of the church founders, one of the um, early saints of the chain, uh, church, not only translated the Bible into Latin, but he wrote a great deal about Mary. And he, uh, Mary's, the importance of her being a virgin and virginity. And someplace I know and he wrote in his writings, that, oh, he regretted he was himself not a virgin. But he, he withdrew into the desert to pull himself away from the temptations of the flesh. And he wrote later in a kind of a memoirs about his, what he went through. So this is what he said. All the company I had was scorpions and wild beasts. He's in the desert in Syria. And uh, at times I felt surrounded, but at times I felt my sur surrounded by clusters of pretty girls and the fires of lust were lighted in my frozen body and moribund flesh. So it was that I wept continually and starved the rebellious flesh for weeks at a time. Often I joined day to night and did not stop beating my breast until the Lord restored my peace of mind. Well, what he has here, he has a stone in his hand. So he will be, and it's outstretched because he's repeatedly beating himself beating himself. And the only fairly calm and languorous, in fact, rather sensual creature in here is his lion, which is his uh, identifying feature. So um, this was for a, a painting, uh, as we know, it would be one of many that never got done. It's about three and a half feet high. 
And I have just a, a detail of the head that I brought in. So you can see the way Leonardo worked. First, he worked extremely slowly. And he didn't follow the normal practice. He did not make a complete drawing and then pounce that drawing onto the wood frame. These are still mainly paintings on wood. Um, so that it was all there and then he could fill it in with color. It's kind of hard to imagine what this would have been in color. Um, <clears throat> but instead he drew and then he continued to draw on the surface. So it wasn't finished when he transferred it onto this wood panel. Uh, but he continued and he changed it and he changed it and he changed a little more and it changed a little more. So it continued to be a creative process all the way through. And it seems as if an incapacity to make himself stop the creative element. Isn't that awful to have to say stop being creative? Is what hindered his finishing things. He worked slowly and perfecting it. Um, and so he, he started here with the design and then what does he do? He starts in with the darks and then builds the lights out of that. So he's looking at the world as a world created of shadow and then lights come into the shadow to bring out the forms. And he also recognizes that lights alter the colors depending on how much light is in them. So it is on his observation of the real world rather than on the obedience to the practices of good workshops that he is um, producing something new. I get the sense of both his certainty and, and the kind of tentative way he's working, because look, he's just in a few places dabbed a little color. Maybe this line wasn't quite where he wanted to be. Was there too much shadow there? He wanted to diminish it. Look how minute the changes are that he makes. Then here he's dabbed in a little color too. This is a little more color. Uh, he might paint a little. He put like a golden over the sort of like a plaster that's laid on the wood. Then he put this kind of like, that's made glassy smooth. And then there's this kind of like a golden layer. And then he built up darks and layers on, and lights on top of that. So there's always this dark and also golden undertone to what he does. But then look at Jerome. Oh, how can you not <laughs> in this image? How is that for inner anguish? You know he's looking in, not out. Leonardo has begun his studies of anatomy begun doing dissections. So he's doing with some certainty, the strain here. A bit of the jaw seen there. Now this might be by Verrocchio, his teacher. And that's probably a drawing that was as a, that was a drawing and then colored, but it was a preparatory for a painting. That's also St. Jerome. And he too is looking up. But oh my goodness. For me, that just moves me to my core. Whereas this is an illustration. Something else that 
Alina was doing, or probably broke your tooth, it's quite unusual. It's just showed Jerome without a beard. Uh, that's like the lioness, which is one of standard attributes. But he wants to show the haggard face, the harrowing ordeals he puts himself through. And so you have to show it. This is by Durer with a more conventional Jerome with a rock. Actually, Durer probably did this based on an Italian painting on his first trip to Italy. And then the Adoration of the Magi, um, another unfinished work. You see how large it is. It's um, eight feet by eight feet. Uh, it was a commission given by monks to Leonardo that he was creating to, to create an altarpiece for a church just outside the walls of Florence. And um, the contract still survives. And, and I guess it was already recognized by then. Uh, he was only a couple of years out of working as a pupil, but um, that he worked very slowly. And so, uh, and that he, that he was different from everybody else and what he did was just extraordinary. But the, the commission was sort of like, provided him with assistance, um, made him guarantee that he would have it done in 30 months, uh, did everything to sort of provide a, a contractual support to make sure the work got done. Well, obviously it never did. And I will, we'll, we'll take a couple excursions with this too. So here it is in his state. There are just a few areas where there's some paint with that lapis lazuli. How, how to imagine this in color, but figures, so many figures engulfed in darkness. And were they not engulfed in darkness, there would hardly be room for them. Um, well, maybe to go through this part and then, yeah, and then I know what I'll do next. I want to point out two other features that are novel in what he's doing. Um, not only does he give figures more complex poses, and I'm going to compare this some some Botticelli's where you'll see that, so that they all seem infused with this extra life. But then he also interlocks them so that they lean over and around one another. So there are many, many more figures crowded in here without a sense of it's being like traffic jam. And it's another way of just increasing the sense of life in it. Now, there's something that's typical uh, Renaissance, all Renaissance, there's this basic geometry of the triangle of two of the wise men and Mary with the Christ child. But then let's compare to Botticelli. This Botticelli's, maybe show you two of these. This is a, mm, five years earlier, also in Florence. Here's Botticelli himself over here, staring out at us. The story of the adoration of the Magi when they come to see Mary and Jesus and Joseph, as he's just born in Bethlehem, was an extremely popular story in Florence. And that's because among the elite, among the Medici, um, there, there was a... Um, sort of a confraternity of the, of the Magi. And every five years, they put on this elaborate pageant in Florence where they reenacted the Magi coming to Bethlehem and say each may make us, each wise man would have maybe a hundred local people in his retinue. And they all had extremely elaborate costumes with the wealthiest fabrics, with these dazzling events that, um, express the Medici's devotion, their wealth, 
um, it also helped to unify people. You know how if you're in a chorus, you're in a play, you're in a band, you do something with a group, how there's that sense of unity. So it was it actually worked within their political system as well. And in this one here, we have, well, this is the founder of the Medici dynasty and his two sons. There are other members of the Medici, but there's quarreling nowadays about which one is whom. But these are almost all portraits. So you see, this not thought of as being secular. That that's a they're not making that that distinction secular sacred. And then there's a part of a ancient building here, a ruin that maybe could represent the palace of David, but more likely. It is this um, Catholic um, stressing that Christianity grew out of the ruins of paganism. <clears throat> and then this slightly later version. Again, by Botticelli. But now look at the pose, say this figure. Do you see how, if you take up the angle, just the back, the head is on the same plane, and um, to the degree that figure turns, the head turns about exactly the same amount. There's not that inner torsion. This figure slightly, but mainly not. And there's ample space around them. Oh, this is one of Leonardo's. Uh, a gazillion drawings and preparation, but we don't have time for that. Go back. So he leans over, but the head tips back. This one, his right leg. Oh, let's see, his left leg moves slightly over to the right side, and then his torso turns in. And then of course you see how this one was the S slant and they turn back all these new ways of creating vitality. Or in Mary's figure, who is so calm, so loving, so sweet on her face, there is nothing but this delight and repose. Look at her legs. She's not sitting with both feet firmly planted in front of her. This knee is slightly higher and they're turned over this way. Her torso turns a little. Her arm reaches across even further. Her head leans down. The Christ child's body, it's only the upper chest that moves over. And here's a curious child and also, of course, making the gesture of blessing. On one side in the background, there are all Leonardo's favorite horses. A uh, scene of battle. Somewhere back in here, I, this detail doesn't show, he even has an elephant in here. He's just working out his design, again, on his finished surface. See, there's some point, there's something, been a building down here, something, some heads, and he doesn't follow through on that. What's going on here? A fallen warrior, a dog. Mm, maybe some he'll keep, maybe he won't. He's just sketched these in a little bit. And then he'd plan for the other side. Now he knows perspective. This is incredibly meticulous ruling out of this now very elaborate structure with a camel. More battling horses, building partly under construction, incident after incident after incident in here.
and ultimately, well, it's not ultimately, but the point at which he left it, it's like this. So what happened? Well, this is the perfect time to say what happened because it's exactly going, what I'm going to do. He left it. Uh, he was invited by the Duke of Milan to go to Milan. So he left the painting unfinished. And the monks, as this is a kind of recognition of the quality of what he did. They never asked anyone to finish it. They had someone come in and do another painting instead because it was widely recognized that this was simply so great that in itself, it stayed just the way it was. One of what is a long parade of unfinished masterpieces by Leonardo. All right, well, there's certainly an unfinished, but I won't, next time we will not be doing, I will not be doing, comparing him so much to what his peers are doing and we will just, take his works and his triumphs and his anguishes and work our way through them. And if there are any questions, um, please unmute and talk away. Anybody, anything? Guess that. All right, I'll see you next week. Thank you. Thank you, Maggie. Thanks, Maggie. Thank you. Maggie, Maggie you're so thorough that People just don't yeah. have any questions. You I know. I, I, I had a sense of pandemonium to the ground by the time. <laughs> yeah, we're just stunned. We're like, oh boy, right, you sorry, cover sorry. a lot of ground. <laughs>